the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Good, morning. Good morning. I welcome you to worship here at Celebration on this Trinity Sunday that follows Pentecost. We're glad you're here. Um, members, guests, friends alike, uh, wherever you are watching or participating, we're glad that you are joining in this community for worship today. For those of you who are here in person, if you'll find and sign the friendship pads, there are also, there are also prayer cards in those little portfolios. And if you have a joy or concern to share, please complete one of those cards. We'll gather them before we have prayer time. For those of you at home, if you will check in on Facebook and like or love or comment to let us know you're with us, uh, we're just glad to know you're here. So thank you. And I extend this invitation. If you're in need of a community to belong to, if you're thirsty for God's word of life and want to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ, then join us in ministry and mission. Friends, you are welcome here. You are needed here. And we are glad you are with us here at Celebration Presbyterian Church. Now I'm going to invite Cindy Smith, our liturgist, forward to get us started. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. <laughs> Open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to, to see your presence. presence. Open our arms to, to the embrace presence. of the community. Open our minds to, to the beauty of truth. truth. And open our hearts to, to the joy of life. life. Our opening prayer. Loving God. Today as we gather for worship, we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. On this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord from generations past and present and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and splendor. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. Amen. Please join in the opening hymn 761 called as partners in Christ's service. Thank you. 
Well, friend, I'm going to invite you to come down and meet me. Will you come down front? There, there it is. <clears throat> so back when uh, I was a younger person like you in church, um, they taught me something about the church that used our hands. Have you ever seen this before? You got to fold your fingers like that. No, like that. No, like that. No, put them up. Tip them up. Now, now, fold them over like this and say, here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door, and there's all the people. Now, see if you do it like you did, you say, Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, but whoops, there's no people. <laughs> so let's try it again. We're going to put them together like this. We're going to sweep them over, and we're going to say, Here is the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and here are the people. All right? Yeah. We're gonna. Pretty cool? Yeah. It's amazing how just changing from that to that can fill the church with lots of life, right? <laughs> lots of wiggly people. All right, let's put our praying hands together and say thank you, God, for our church and for all the wiggly people that bring it life. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace out. A few announcements, reminders this morning. If you haven't already signed the friendship pad or filled out your prayer card, now would be a good time. Uh, we'll be with you Tuesday evening for Vespers on the 14th at 7.30. But probably going to be the last one for June because I'm going to be gone for a little bit. We'll start up again in July, okay? I know I've got a favorite fellow over here. I've got to prepare him for the changes that might be coming. Summer choir rehearsal, normally Sundays at 10, but not next Sunday, okay? Bob and I will both be at the Worship and Music Conference at Montreat for a week, suffering in the mountains of western North Carolina, where it might be several degrees cooler, still humid there, but several degrees cooler, and it's mountains. So we'll enjoy some of that for you, and we'll bring back lots of enthusiasm. Uh, we want to thank you for your continued donations of staple foods and personal care items. Next Sunday is going to be a Mission Emphasis Sunday, and you'll be hearing lots of uh, in interesting insights about ways that we do mission, ways that you can become more involved. If you have donations, you can bring them on Sundays or throughout the work week of Monday to Thursday, 9 to 2. We have a collection bin in the hallway uh, just in front of the um, water fountains. If you have prayer requests through the week, please communicate them to Irma Stackhouse, our administrator. You can either email or phone those in. We try to relay them on quickly to our prayer chain and include changes and updates here on Sunday mornings. Uh, now, I'm going to call us to confession. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's enjoy a time of confessing our sins collectively first, and then personally in a few moments of silence. Let's pray together. O oh, Holy One, we call to you and name you as eternal, ever-present and boundless in love. Yet there are times, O oh God, when we fail to recognize you in our ordinary daily lives. Sometimes shame clenches tightly around our hearts and we hide our true feelings. Sometimes fear makes us small and we miss the chance to speak from our strength. Sometimes doubt invades our hopelessness and we degrade our own wisdom. Holy God, in the daily round from sunrise to sunset, 
Remind us again of your holy presence hovering near us and in us. Free us from shame and self-doubt. Help us to see you in the moment-by-moment -moment possibilities to live honestly, to act courageously, and to speak from our wisdom. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Friends, hear the good news and believe it. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. How good of God and thanks be to God. Now let's say what we believe as we affirm our faith sharing the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now as we come to our time of sharing our joys and concerns, if you have a prayer card, if you'll lift it up, our ushers will gather them and bring them forward. And as we prepare our hearts for praying, our hymn is number 722. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 3. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Please remain seated. Peggy O'Neill asks prayer. She says an update on the friend's son who has multiple personality disorder. Uh, he has finished the program in Austin, Texan, Texas with flying colors, is now back in his home in Spartanburg. He's doing well, but he will continue um, to struggle as he moves forward. So we pray for his mom and dad and for him over the months to come as he's still adjusting. 
Judy Leonard asked prayers for her brother, Marlon, for good results from a liver biopsy. I also understand that Bob Stepnick is in the uh, Conway Hospital being checked out for kidney troubles. Please remember the family and friends of those who have been caught up in the mass shootings. Please remember the people of Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and Russia. Remember Jim Rakes as he continues his rehab in Florence. Skip Singer, who's dealing with kidney transplant issues. Steve Redding for COVID recovery and then pending knee replacement surgery that has been scheduled for this coming Friday if it goes forward as anticipated. Uh, please pray for Betsy Hughes' brother-in-law, Bill. Uh, we lift up Margaret Reeder. She's doing much better from a recent fall and assured me that she did not have COVID. She tested negative with a PCR test. Read a calendar uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, Alex and Mason Hofer grieving the death of father and husband. We lift up Anita Brooks recovering from an injured shoulder. Mary Virginia Brooks, their sister-in-law, undergoing radiation and chemo. We lift up Deb Redding, sister-in-law of Kathy and Steve, who's still recovering from a broken rib. We lift up Robert Callender Jr. and pray for his continued health and wellness. We lift up Robert Callender's brother, Hugo Jones, in Brooklyn, New York, for his health and wellness. We pray for Marjorie Jones for her continued rehab and transitional care. We lift up Karen, <clears throat> sister of Sylvia Kernow, who's undergoing chemo and radiation. We pray for Bernie Pettijohn as she's uh, dealing with knee issues and Terry as he's still regaining strength and mobility. We lift up Alan and Sandy Perry. Alan is home with hospice care and Sandy, his primary caregiver. We lift up Robert and Rita's sister in Florida. We pray for Ronald Hughes. This is a friend of Robert Callender. He's battling cancer for the second time and is improving and sends his appreciation for the ongoing prayers. We lift up Dorothy Parker. We pray for Peggy O'Neill's friends. We lift up Lillian Stilgis. We pray for Lois Crone. She has now moved to Myrtle Manor uh, for her ongoing rehabilitation. We lift up Kathy Harms for her overall healing and wellness and for Wayne as her caregiver. We pray for Mary Lou Strom, friend of Carol Mitchell's, who's undergoing dialysis several times a week now. <clears throat> we pray for Kent and his family, friends of Carol Mitchell. His wife is in failing health in ICU for the past three weeks, and Kent is facing some difficult choices. We lift up the family and friends of Gail Stanley, another neighbor and friend of Donna Woodard's. Uh, she died recently. Uh, Brian Ward, who's battling pancreatic cancer. Ashlyn Burroughs for safety, wellness, and protection. We pray for Carol Legassi's former son-in-law, Troy Mudgett, in his ongoing battle with stage four cancer. We pray for Lee Peters for healing and strength and for Sharon, his caregiver. We lift up Jesse Wallace and pray his continued healing from shingles. We lift up Jeff Walsh and pray for ongoing efficacy in his cancer treatments. We also pray especially for son Davis his recent back surgery led to some spinal fluid leakage and that has improved. He is now out of the hospital. Eventually, he's looking at a second hip replacement. We pray for all who are infected and battling COVID. <coughs> Excuse me. We lift up our healthcare workers and first responders. We pray for the families of our veterans and for the veterans to get the necessary care that they need. We lift up Lauren Hancock for strength and emotional healing, for Patty Youngblood for health and wellness, for Ron Plummer's niece, Casey, 
and for Madeline Tillis and her progress with recovery from traumatic brain injury. We pray for our congregation and our ongoing mission and ministry. We pray for our preschool staff that they'll have a safe summer. We also lift up all of our area graduates and pray their safety in this time of transition to the what next in their lives. Friends, let's bow together now in prayer. On this Trinity Sunday, we proclaim, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. All credit and praise are due to you, O Lord, most high. For you are mighty and magnificent above all else. You are stunning in creation and redemption, beyond our wonder, in power and in blessing. By your grace, we are bold to bring you our prayers for hearts that are mourning, for gun violence that is wreaking havoc on your world, for lives that are displaced, for injustices that seem endless, and for love that is, for the joys and struggles of relationships, for the opportunities and for doubts and for dreams. We trust in you, O Christ, through uncertainty and hope. Receive our stories, complicated and faulty as they are. Speak faith and courage to our questions and worries. Let your spirit reconcile us to fear for dynamic new life. Almighty God, known as wisdom before the dawn of creation, Lord Jesus Christ, perfect love made flesh. Holy Spirit of God, ever-present, O hidden source of life, wrapped up in perfect trinity, we med meditate upon the great and gracious plan which you have brought to pass, that women and men like us should look beyond creation to worship you, the creator of all things. Holy Trinity, let us not harbor anything in our hearts that might spoil our fellowship with you or with one another. Work with us, work within us, do what you will with us, make of us what you want of us, change us as we need to be changed, and use us as your will requires. Creator God, bless, help, and heal all those whom we have called by name and special need this day. Strengthen each of us for carrying out your witness and work in the world around us. Empowered by your spirit and guided by your love revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Blessed Trinity, it is for your kingdom to come in fullness that we now pray. Filled with your spirit and using the words that Jesus taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's finish our song with verses 4 and 5 of hymn number 722.
Friends, as we come to the time of receiving tithes and offerings, for those of you who are gathered here, we have a plexiglass receptacle on the table just inside the sanctuary. And you may place your tithes and offerings there. For those of you worshiping with us on Facebook Live, you may mail in a check, drop by a check if you're here local. You can go through your online banking and direct it this way. Or from anywhere that you have web access, you can go to our church website and use the Donate Now or the Recurring Payment option. However you choose to give, you have chosen to give and give generously throughout the pandemic. And we offer you our thanks and we appreciate all you do day by day. Now hear this invitation to the offering. God of new life, out of the abundance of our lives, we offer these gifts to you. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source of hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. We offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing the doxology number 582, Glory to God, whose goodness shines on me. Without end, without end, 
dedication. For the wondrous gift of life, we are thankful, O God. Your generous outpouring of grace reminds us of the fruitful life we're called to bear. May these gifts of time and labor therefore embody our desire to share and contribute to your coming reign among us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Today we have two New Testament scripture lessons that give us insights into the early church. First, Acts chapter 2, and then a few verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. First, though, let's prepare our hearts with a few moments of silence, followed by the prayer for illumination. O oh God, open our hearts and minds and souls to hear your word as if for the very first time. Help us experience anew the surprise and joy that your presence in the word can bring us. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Listen. Hear the word of God, first from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. This describes for us the day-to-day -day life among those early believers. Luke is writing and he says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Then from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through chapter 6, verse 2. Paul is writing and he says, For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live <clears throat> no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is... In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God as we work together with him we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain for he says at an acceptable time I have listened to you and on a day of salvation I have helped you 
See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, <clears throat> listen and hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. <clears throat> For the next few minutes, let's think about what it means to be a church on fire, made new in Christ. Now, when I say the word church, just like that, church, what image pops into your head? What comes to mind? Is it an image that excites you and energizes you? Or is it an image that makes you yawn and snooze? I've seen both in church, I promise you. <laughs> See, I've got a perfect perspective for scanning the crowd. But when you think about the church in your life, not just church in general, are there thoughts that are characterized more by enthusiasm and adventure and hope? Or does it fall to the side of boredom and predictability and irrelevance? Well, if we're talking primarily about the first century church, those questions are fairly easy to answer. Those first century Christians became so excited about their message that onlookers on Pentecost accused them of being drunk early in the morning, like we read last Sunday. Those first Christians became so energetic about their mission and ministry that they came to be labeled as troublemakers. And many of them over the course of their life would be thrown in prison, and many of them would be killed for their faithful living and serving of Christ. And despite their small numbers and limited resources, they were so filled with the spirit of the living God that they literally began to turn the world upside down as the ministry and the mission of Christ spread throughout the known world. Wherever the church of Jesus Christ was, something significant was happening. You could pin a lot of labels on them, but you'd never have called those first Christians dull or predictable or lifeless or irrelevant. Looking at the early church, it's not surprising that the primary symbol that came to be associated with the church was fire. Uh, if you look at the Methodist symbol, it has one flame across a cross. But well, we Presbyterians, not to be outdone, put two flames on the sides of our cross because we wanted folks to know we believe in the Spirit of God. Those first century Christians were on fire with the Spirit, and wherever they were, things were happening. Sometimes I think that the fire of the early church is only flickering in our present time in history. It seems to a large extent that we have domesticated the church. We have tamed it down. We've painted the church in dull hues and allowed it to blend in fairly well to the surrounding culture to where we may not stand out as we once did. I fear that in too many minds, the dominant image of the church today is that of a cozy old institution that is out of touch. To whatever extent that image is accurate, to that extent the church has ceased authentically to be the church. Throughout history, the church was, has tended to wander away from the Lord, get off track, and begin to doze. And so we can look across history and see at times how God has reached down and stirred things up to shake it up a bit. We've had great awakenings. God wakes up the church, breathes new life into it, and gets things back on track. I hope, I trust that it's beginning to happen again in our time, especially in this strange season of pandemic. I've met a lot of folks that have told me the church has made it so easy not to go to church. Well, that thinks about church as a building, but as we were identifying earlier, it's really the people. Technology has made it possible for us to gather 
anywhere you've got access to a computer or a cell phone and a signal. I pray that God is beginning to stir the smoldering ashes of the church so that flames of renewal will dance and leap and come alive again as this pandemic continues to transition and hopefully fade. Like Isaiah said long ago, I believe that God is beginning to make the church anew and that we need not get lost looking back at the former things and telling ourselves, ah, the good old days. We long for that. And yet, in longing for looking back, we can miss the new things that God is doing right now in our midst. So that's the word, new. It's a promise in Scripture in many places, but Paul says it in our passage this morning when he says, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. I believe that exciting, growing, productive times are ahead for us as God gives and as we receive God's ongoing gifts of newness. Let's look at a few aspects of newness to look for in ourselves and in Christ's church as we go forward. First, I believe that God wants to give each of us a new identity. The life of faith and obedience is not some pleasant additive, some optional extra that we tack on to the periphery of our life so that we feel better about ourselves. Our life in Christ is the central core and content of life for us modern day Christ followers. It defines us and it directs us, not just ministers, but all of us as followers of Christ. The church rightly understood is not just a place where we go or an organization to which we belong. It's who we are. It's our basic identity in life that we are Christ followers who live as the church in the world today. If you ask me who I am, well, I'll tell you, I'm Tom Dendy. I'm a beloved child of God, baptized as an infant. It tells you whose I am and who I am. That's my identity. That's how I define myself. From my infant baptism, I'm a member of the body of Christ and a vital part of the community of Christ followers throughout time, throughout the world, forever and ever. Amen. Perhaps we just don't celebrate our Christian identity enough today. Maybe we downplay it. But it's time to recover the radical nature of what it means to be a Christ follower. We must not be comfortable when people profess their faith in Christ and are baptized and join our churches and then continue to live in the same old way as if nothing new or significant has happened. It's not ours to point the finger at them and blame them, but it's ours to encourage and nurture change within them so that when persons come to Christ, they truly experience the new creation and new identity and new way of living that we're called to in Christ Jesus. That's part of what baptism is all about. When we're baptized, we are sealed with the seal of Christ. We are named and claimed as Christ's own, from which the name Christian comes. We are claimed as a child of God for all eternity. We're washed clean and set on this pathway of pilgrimage to walk with Christ throughout our lifetime. If we understand this, and if we are in fact a new creation in Christ, then wherever we go, we are the church. We are the presence of Christ in the world, Christ's own ambassadors taking his ministry, Paul says, of reconciliation to a broken and hurting world of people around us. God worked in Christ to reconcile us to God's self, 
And then he gave us that ministry of reconciling so that we would help others be reconciled to God as well. Friends, as Christ followers, we are the church at home, on the job, in retirement, at the grocery store, in the voting booth, at the ball game, on the golf course, among our friends and family, wherever, whenever we are, we are Christ followers and therefore the church. So we're representing, whether we're mindful of it or not, hopefully we're representing in love so that others, when they see us, experience something of the love of God. Let's be clear. The church is not primarily a building or just a place we gather or just another social organization to which we belong. The church of Jesus Christ is who we are. Bob's going to come forward and as I've said and sung to you before, you are the church and I am the church and we are the church together. This morning we've given you the words along with the verses. And we're going to share it with you and then invite you to share along with us. So first the choir will sing through verse 1 and then we'll invite you to join us in singing all the verses.
thanks for helping in this sermon. If we're in Christ, we are a new creation, Paul says. That's God's gift first to you and me. And the second gift is that God wants to give us a new sense of community. A life of faith is intensely personal, but it's not private. There is no Lone Ranger Christian in the world today because we've been called to be part of Christ's body. Therefore, it means we belong to each other. We're accountable to each other. So a solitary Christian is a contradiction in terms. To be Christian is to be part of the church, which is the body of Christ, the community of faith, the village that helps bring us up in Jesus Christ. Historians tell us that the things that most impressed and impacted the first century world was the way in which Christians loved one another and supported one another. I've experienced it. Whenever I'm with my church family, I feel at home. I feel that I belong. And whenever the family gets together, it's like having a come as you are. Let's get together and celebrate. We know that we can bring whatever's the reality of our lives and it will be okay. We will be loved and we will still belong. The faith fact is we need one another in the church because none of us is complete all by him or herself. To be complete, we must be joined together and collectively joined to Christ. We're not made to function in isolation. We've learned a lot about that throughout COVID. You know when introverts have had too much aloneness that it's a problematic time. And I've got some introverted friends that have said, I've reached my limit of aloneness. I need some interaction. We were created by God to live in community. For example, no one of us has all the truth of the gospel, but you share your experience and understanding and I share my experience and understanding. And with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we come closer together to knowing the fullness of God's truth. I'm not always strong and faithful, but if when I'm weak, you can be strong for me, then perhaps I can be strong for you when you are weak. And together we find strength that's needed to carry on for Christ. Honestly, there are times when my faith is dim. But I get with my church family and I feed off your faith until my own faith is relit and I'm strengthened again. It means so much to belong to a community of faith. We really care about one another here so that we rejoice with those who are rejoicing. We weep with those who are weeping. Through compassion and care, we identify with one another so that our joys may be complete and our struggles may be shared. I believe that we can face most anything as long as we're not alone as long as there are those who will lovingly come alongside us and share our experiences in life with us. The good news, and you've perhaps heard this said before, that in God's mathematics, it works like this. When we are in a caring community of Christ, our joys are doubled and our sorrows are cut in half simply by sharing and caring. I want you to know just how much it means to have a group of people who are on my side, pulling for me, praying for me, and with me, encouraging me, loving me, at times chastising me. I've especially felt your presence and support in the time I've been here through the sickness and death of my parents. I thank you. You just can't know how much it means to be upheld. There's plenty of the stuff going on in the world today that can drag you down. It can dull the divine image that's in us. It can darken our spirit. But it means so very much to know that you have a cheering section who encourages 
the very best in you, who can be counted on to shout out, you can do it, you can make it, we believe in you. If we are in Christ, Paul says, there's a new creation. Everything will become new, including our sense of community. We will not feel isolated or alone. The third gift God wants to give us is a new sense of urgency about our mission. There's a twofold motion within the church. We gather together, we worship God, we sense God's direction, and then we scatter. We gather and we scatter. We gather to get the message and we scatter to share it. We gather for worship, for study, for fellowship, for nurture, for fun, for laughter, for planning our mission and, mission, uh, mission and ministry strategy, and for pooling our necessary resources to help it happen. That's both human and financial resources. Then we scatter to go be God's people in the world, carrying out mission in the name of God to our neighbors. There's, there's ministry work for us to do outside the walls of this building. As a result of what happens when we gather together here to worship and study and meet. Part of our mission is to tell the story. The old, old story of God's amazing grace and love. Like the hymn writer said, I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme and glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. We are to pass on to others the life-giving gifts which God has entrusted to us. They've been given for us to give away because we can never lose them. The more we give, the more we receive to give. What I mean by that is we've been loved, so we in turn are to give love. We've been forgiven, so we are to forgive. We have been helped, so we in turn are sent out to help others. It's a clear biblical principle that we have been blessed not to just rest on our laurels, but to be a blessing to others. As I read the New Testament, what jumps out at me is that Jesus did not seem to be interested in love only as an emotion, as a feel-good thing. What made sense to Jesus was loving action and deeds. What made sense to him was that the hungry were being fed, the naked were being clothed, the sick were being healed, those who were in prison were being visited. That's love, according to Jesus, not just something we feel, but a feeling that causes us to act and go do active love. Jesus was disturbingly direct in Matthew chapter 25 when he said, just as you did it to the least of these, my little ones, you did it unto me. If I understand that correctly, it means that we are to treat every person in need as if he or she were Christ, including ourselves. See, healthy self-love is included in the equation. If we live as one who lives with shame and self-loathing, it's hard for us to put off that and to go and be loving and caring among others. So our mission is to discover what God is already busy doing in the world outside these walls to discover people's needs, and then to partner with God and partner with others in helping to meet the needs of the world around us. The good news of the gospel is not just about what God has done for the world through Christ. It's also about what God wants to do for the world through us, the church. We are to be about mission in the name of Christ with a passion, and if we are in Christ, Paul says we're a new creation and everything will be new, including this new urgency to be about mission. Finally, and most important of all, what I've talked about becomes possible only when it's grounded in a new life, a life-changing experience brought about by Jesus Christ, who is our Savior first 
and then Lord of life. We can't do what Christ calls us to do unless we're first willing to become who Christ wants us to be. And we become the new creation when we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord. And then we live the rest of our life growing into the fullness of the joy of discipleship. Living with Him. Learning from Him. Loving with Him and serving alongside Him. We can't love others unconditionally like that unless we have encountered love in that way. Maybe we didn't get it at home, but we can find it in Christ. Only then can we follow the command of Christ to love one another as I have loved you. Friends, if we are in Christ, we're a new creation. Everything will become new, including new experiences of Christ as our Savior and Lord. As we continue to live through this world pandemic, May we seek God's direction for new ways to love our neighbors, new ways to reach out in mission and to minister to a world that has been dramatically altered by fear and isolation and dis-ease with things as they are, with growing anxiety, growing hate speech, and growing angry divisions. As we live out our 20th year of ministry and mission in this year, 2022, may the new life promised and given us in Christ enliven us and empower us in the Spirit to discover new ways to love others and to reach out to our neighbors in need, to offer hope, to offer them a relevant word that can sustain them in good times as well as in the most difficult times that they will face. Like the old camp song boldly proclaimed, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around can warm up to its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread God's love to everyone. You want to pass it on. Friends, God has lit a fire within us joining us with the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit for sharing the life-changing and world-changing gospel of Jesus Christ with power given by God and persistence to this world just outside our doors so that God might ignite a flame within all those we encounter and all those that we love along our way. Now, as you are able, please stand and join me in singing our closing hymn number 442, Just As I Am.
Please be seated for just a few reminders through the post loop. I want to thank you all for your service in support of Celebration Presbyterian Church by your participation, your prayers, and your generosity. I remind us of Tuesday Virtual Vespers. This week will be the last for this month. It's at 7.30 p.m. on the 14th. Summer Choir Rehearsal will resume in two weeks at 10 a.m. Uh, we invite you to invite your friends to join us for worship next Sunday. It'll be a Mission Emphasis Sunday led by Cecilia Evans and others. Uh, so get fired up and come on back. Now hear this charge. May celebration be known as a church on fire for God through our loving, serving, seeking, sending, sharing, and caring. Now go forth into the world with compassion and justice in your heart. Give voice to the silent. Give strength to the weak. Hear one another. See one another. Care for one another and love one another. It's all that easy. And it's all that hard. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.